Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Coming up on our program, the threat of flooding at the Oroville Dam may have receded, but concerns are rising about the urgent need to maintain California's aging infrastructure. And on the 75th anniversary of the executive order that authorized the internment of Japanese Americans, I'll talk with a lawyer who challenged its legality. Plus, veteran politician and stand-up comic Tom Amiano on what he's learned as a legislator and entertainer. But first, as part of our continuing coverage of the first 100 days of the new administration, earlier this week, Mike Flynn resigned as national security advisor when it was revealed that he had discussed sanctions with a Russian diplomat before Donald Trump took office. That leaves a critical position vacant as questions swirl over communications between the Trump administration and Russia. Meanwhile, Bay Area Congressman Eric Swalwell, who sits on the House Intelligence Committee, is urging an independent bipartisan probe into Russian hacking of the presidential election. KQED senior editor of California Politics and Government Scott Schaefer talked with third-term Congressman Eric Swalwell. Congressman Swalwell, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Scott. I want to ask you about a story that broke this morning about the National Guard. There were uh, reports that uh, the Trump administration is thinking of using the National Guard in several states, including California, as a kind of deportation force. Uh, the administration denies it, but AP had a memo, it was kind of a draft memo outlining the steps. What are you hearing about this, and, and what are your thoughts about it? I'm worried over the past few weeks, uh, we've become less us as a country. You look at the Muslim ban that was put into place uh, just a few weeks back. Uh, our closest allies are wondering if we're going to be there for them and whether American leadership is still going to prevail. And then today's report uh, is troubling because you just uh, can picture armies in the streets uh, breaking up uh, and tearing up families. And so I hope it's not true. Uh, I'm, you know, our staff is asking questions of the administration and, and I'm hoping to have an answer by Monday. But uh, th this would be uh, taken us to a place we've never been before, and I don't think any of us want to go to. What recourse would there be if this kind of policy, or even the travel ban, which is going to be reintroduced in a new executive order uh, next week? I mean, the courts, of course, are one way to go, but what about, I mean, there could be a huge reaction uh, from people. And, and fortunately, we're not helpless, uh, and I think the president is learning that there are two other branches of government, and that Congress has a role to play. You know, we authorize and fund. You sure uh, he's getting that? Yeah, because I, he, <laughs> I, I sometimes think, he acts like a king. And I think sometimes uh, civics lessons uh, could help him. But uh, certainly he's learning that the courts uh, have a sign off on, you know, constitutionality and that Congress uh, funds this. And so uh, we're going to continue to assert ourselves. But fortunately, the American people uh, are also with us and they're going to the streets. And when I went to SFO, when the Muslim ban was in place, I was struck by how many people told me this is the first time they've ever gone to a political rally or a cause in their life. So people are awake now. For many years, uh, you were trying to get millennials more involved and engaged. Do you feel like President Trump maybe has done that for you? Yeah, well, he, he has certainly helped. So if, if anyone slept past the alarm clock on November 8, uh, as I said, they're awake now and they understand uh, that these issues are important and that uh, they're, you know, we can do something about it. Let me ask you about Russia. Uh, as you know, there are uh, many uh, allegations and charges, some of which have been substantiated by the intelligence community about Russian involvement in the election and during the campaign with uh, the Trump, uh, Trump campaign. You're calling for an independent bipartisan commission committee to look into this. Uh, Senator McCain and others are saying, no, we can do it in a committee uh, in, in the Senate. What's the status of that? Why is it important, do you think, to do it in an independent way? Yeah. So I'm principally focused on the future because the intelligence finding that worries me the most is that Russia intends to do this again. They attacked us uh, during the last election and they are taking on a lessons learned campaign to do this again. So I think the only way to make sure we understand how we were so vulnerable and how we can make sure it never happens again is to have an independent commission that is depoliticized that declassifies the facts behind the findings and also debunks a lot of what the president has put out there. Today, uh, we learned that a Republican uh, has joined us. I talked to Congressman Walter Jones, thanked him for getting on board, and now every Democrat in the House is on board. We have the first Republican, and I hope uh, that this motivates others to get on board because this is really about the future of our democracy, and it's one worth defending. How much confidence do you have that if it doesn't happen as an independent commission, uh, that the Senate will do a thorough job that follows all the leads, no matter where they go? I, I admire uh, Senators McCain and Graham. They've really stepped up uh, on this, but I'm afraid that you know Congress is so politicized right now that unless we took it out of Congress, 
we really won't get to the bottom uh, of what happened. So I, you know, there's a role for us to play in, on the Intelligence Committee. I serve as the ranking member of the CIA. Uh, we're undergoing our own uh, investigation. And there's a lot of questions also about whether there were any political, personal, or financial ties between Donald Trump and his team and the Russian government. And I think the American people deserve to know that. What does it say to you that there are so many leaks coming out of so many agencies, including the intelligence community. I mean, Trump's right. They are illegal, but they're happening on a daily, almost hourly basis. What does that say to you? I, I was disturbed to see the president, uh, before he even took the oath, and uh, continuously, even this week, uh, just go after uh, the patriots who serve in the intelligence community. He has really demeaned and demoralized them. And sometimes, you know, the steam just has to come out of the pot. And he doesn't believe intelligence is relevant. And we're seeing right now that happen. Now, as you said, you know, the Department of Justice investigates leaks. Uh, they should follow the evidence wherever it goes. But I think the larger issue here is that you have a president uh, that doesn't believe in intelligence. And that actually makes all of us less safe. Last question, quickly, if you would. Uh, Obamacare, the ACA, is supposedly going to be uh, repealed and replaced. What does your gut tell you about what's going to happen? Yeah, Americans want the freedom of health care. Uh, and that's what the Affordable Care Act gave them. Certainly, there's improvements that we can make to bring down the costs. But if the Republicans can't expand coverage, reduce the costs, and improve the care, uh, then I don't think any of us uh, should be with it. So tomorrow, uh, in, in Hayward and in Union City and Fremont, we're bringing together uh, community health care uh, providers to talk about how that has given coverage to so many people here in the East Bay. All right, and if it's any uh, indication from previous town hall meetings, you'll have a lot of people that's there. That's right, we hope. All right, Congressman Eric Swalwell, thank you so much for thank coming you. in. This weekend marks the 75th anniversary of the executive order that authorized Japanese internment camps during World War II after Pearl Harbor was attacked. 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, many of them American citizens, were branded military threats and forced to live in internment camps. But Oakland resident Fred Korematsu refused to go. He sued the government, fighting the case all the way to the Supreme Court, and lost. Decades later, with the help of pro bono lawyers, his conviction was overturned. Don Tamaki was one of the attorneys who helped win that reversal. He joins me now to talk about what he sees as the parallels between the Korematsu case and our country's current state. Don, nice to have you here. Thank you for having me, Tui. Well, we'll get to the current state of affairs in a moment, but first take us back to 1942. Why did Fred Korematsu, who was only 23 years old at the time, refuse to go to an internment camp? Fred Korematsu was born in Oakland, so he was an American citizen by birth. Of the 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry you just mentioned, 70,000 were born in this country. Most had never been to Japan. So uh, like the others, Fred felt he was an American citizen, had done no wrong, was loyal to this country, and should not be subject to military orders and ultimately imprisonment. And that's why he fought the orders. And Fred Korematsu was eventually arrested, and he was uh, imprisoned. And what, what was his punishment? Well, uh, he was ultimately uh, sentenced criminally for violating the military orders. But just to give the audience a, a brief overview, December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Within the day of that, Japanese uh, Secret Service swept through the Japanese-American community and arrested uh, community leaders. Within a couple weeks thereafter, curfew was imposed on Americans of Japanese ancestry, including American citizens. Within a few weeks after that, orders were uh, issued to report to assembly centers. In the Bay Area, it was Tanfer and racetracks, surrounded by barbed wire and machine gun towers. And people were herded in there. They have to abandon their businesses, their homes. They lost their jobs. Uh, men, women, and, ch and children, the young and uh, the old were all herded together in these camps, uh, temporary, while uh, 10 American-style concentration camps were being constructed from California to Arkansas. So by the end of 1942, uh, almost 120,000 people were incarcerated. So it started off as something very incremental, right? There was that curfew put in place where uh, Japanese Americans had to be in their homes from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then it became something much bigger and broader. Do you see parallels between what happened then and what's happening now in our country? I do. I, what, what is very disturbing is uh, the fact that when Japanese Americans were rounded up and interned, uh, the government argued that uh, Japanese Americans were committing acts of espionage and sabotage. And on that basis, uh, Fred uh, challenged the military orders in turning him, but the government presented 
uh, that claim. The, the claim went all the way up to the Supreme Court. He lost in 1944 with the court ruling that the uh, that it was a military necessity, it was a national security to round these these people up. Forty years later, quite by accident, we found uh, secret wartime uh, reports from the FBI, the Federal Communications Commission, the Navy, Army Intelligence. Every intelligence agency had issued reports, had given them to the Army and to the Attorney General of the United States and to the Solicitor General of the United States, stating that none of the claims the Army was making were wrong, were, were correct. They were false. And in fact, Justice Department lawyers uh, sent memos to each other saying that there's no doubt that the Army's claims were fabrications and intentional falsehoods. Yes, and on that basis, the internment happened. Paralleling it today, what is the reason for the travel ban? And what is the reason for uh, uh, banning Muslims from entering this country? And what is the reason for banning refugees who um, uh, went through a 18-month extreme vetting process, uh, who had been issued valid visas, to now be barred entry from the country? And we find that uh, there isn't uh, any factual evidence to now uh, uh, make that claim. And Similarly, in, in 1942, that was the plight of Japanese Americans. So what do you think is the likelihood of something like what happened then, so many decades ago, happening again? Because society has also changed, right? Back when the internment happened, there was very little public outcry. But now you have a lot of people stepping forward and having the rallies and protests and saying this is wrong. Do you think it's, it's the same climate, or is it a little better now in terms of public perception? There's no doubt it's better. I think the legacy of Fred Korematsu is that this ought not to, never to happen to anybody else again. If Fred were alive, he would say it's wrong to discriminate Americans on the basis of their race or religion. It's wrong uh, to ban refugees who have been already vetted through an extreme vetting process, uh, to, who are running for their lives from terrorism to uh, to be barred entry into the country. And it's wrong to discriminate against lawful American residents merely because they happen to look like the enemy. That's exactly what happened in 1942. And I think people now are beginning to realize that, that um, even a president should be questioned. And, and no one is above the law. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, uh, it should be subject to uh, scrutiny and careful attention. The Lessons of History, Don Tamaki, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's been a tumultuous week in Oroville, California, home of the tallest dam in the nation. Nearly 200,000 people were evacuated earlier this week after warnings that the dam could flood. Heavy rains, an untested emergency spillway, and long-known flaws in the design of the dam created a perfect storm for the crisis. Residents have now returned to their homes as crews rush to repair the damage. But more rain is on the way, and the crisis has raised questions about California's vulnerable and aging infrastructure. Joining me now to discuss this are KQED Science Editor Craig Miller and Peter Click, President Emeritus and Chief Scientist at the Pacific Institute. Welcome to you both. Craig, you've been out at Oroville Dam this week. Where do things stand, and are things out of the woods just yet? I think that the, it's certainly the immediate threat has subsided. The uh, lake level has been going down pretty steadily and is well below uh, the point uh, that, that was the most harrowing moment in this chain of events when it actually overtopped the emergency spillway and began that chain of erosion on the hillside that threatened the spillway itself. But I think it's important that, that we acknowledge the, the magnitude of the bullet that we just dodged here. Mm -hmm. uh, had that hillside continued to erode to the point where it undercut and essentially took out that retaining wall on the emergency spillway. We could have been looking at the most catastrophic dam incident in this country since, I'd say, 1976, mm -hmm. when Teton Dam collapsed in Idaho. And there are many more people and much more development downstream from this dam than there was from that one. So another storm is expected to hit Monday. How will mm -hmm. that affect the, the dam? Well, the water managers are pretty confident that uh, the lake's not going to be affected that much by either the storms that pass through over the weekend or the ones that are coming next. Uh, they think they can handle that. Um, but 
again, we're in the middle of February, which is one of the big three precipitation months for California. Uh, and the rainy season runs until April. We get half, that's right, we get half our precipitation between December and, and February. And also, and I don't want to steal too much of Peter's thunder because I know he's going to want to talk about this, but we are entering this new era of intense precipitation events that they really hadn't seen with any regularity when they designed and built this dam. Peter, you want to add to that? We're seeing climate change. It contributed to this storm, this, this season, actually, the one of the wettest winters we've had in 20 years. What does that look like uh, ahead for the state of our dams and, and other aging infrastructure throughout the state? Well, it's been pretty remarkable. We, we had five of the driest years on record, the most severe drought we've seen, followed this year by what may very well turn out to be the wettest year on record in That's over right. 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's consistent with what climate scientists have been saying. Our climate, we know the climate's changing. We know that humans are responsible. We know that there will be very significant impacts on water resources in California and elsewhere. Uh, and among those impacts are more extreme events hotter and warmer and longer droughts, wetter winters, and as Craig mentioned, we worry about especially the snowpack. We get all of our rain and snow in the winter. If it, if it falls as rain instead of snow, if the stuff that falls as snow melts faster because it's warmer, we have to deal with ancient infrastructure to manage that change. And that infrastructure wasn't designed for today's climate or tomorrow's climate. It was designed for yesterday's climate and, and yesterday's climate's gone. So what do we need to do now then to maintain the dams we do have and make sure they're safe? Well, uh, maintenance is a critically important question. That's exactly right. A lot of these dams were built 50 years ago or, or are older. We don't maintain them adequately uh, and they're not designed for the future conditions that we know are here and coming. We need to spend more money on maintenance. We, need to, we, need, to, right. we need to redesign yeah. the way we operate the system as well. It's maintenance, it's operation, it's rules, it's infrastructure, all of those things have to be rethought. And I think that we're not sure at this point where the money is going to come from from that. When they were back to the point of just having a problem with the main spillway at Oroville, they said, oh, we're going to have to replace that whole concrete giant water slide. It's going to cost 100 to $200 million. Now we realize that that's a fraction of the job ahead of us. So. And so should California try to get some federal funding? And what are its chances of getting federal funding for this, given that it's now emerged as pretty much, uh, you know, a center of the resistance against the Trump administration? Well, so there is a new interest in infrastructure in general, energy, transportation, roads, communication, water infrastructure nationwide. That's a nonpartisan, bipartisan issue. I think people understand we need to spend more money. Where that money is going to come from is going to depend. Some of it should be federal money. Some of it's going to have to be local money. Uh, you know, our water bills pay for the water services that we want. And uh, irrigators in the Central Valley, some of the big water agencies, uh, taxpayers, there, there's going to have to be a conversation about how much money we have, where it comes from, and then where it goes. We should point out that the governor did make a request um, of the president uh, for a disaster declaration. This was responded to. There will be federal money coming. But again, one of the reasons that that spillway was not, some people say they never finished the job. It should have been completely lined with concrete. And one of the reasons it wasn't is because the, the people who are expected to use the water, the, the water districts all over California who benefit from that are expected to shoulder some of these costs and they don't necessarily always want to. So then how should we rethink the way we provide water and the way we move water around in this state? Well, I would add to that. We, we have to rethink the way we provide it. That's the way we manage the dams, uh, draw down our aquifers. That's sort of the supply part of the equation. But we also have to rethink the way we use water. Every gallon of water that we don't have to use is a gallon we don't have to store or take out of an overtapped aquifer or move from the mountains to the coast or the Central Valley. We know that there's enormous potential to use water more efficiently in California. That'll reduce pressure on the existing infrastructure. There are also other supply options like treated wastewater we could use much more of, capturing stormwater, recharging our groundwater aquifers. Those have to be part of the new way of thinking about water. It's not just about dams and aqueducts anymore. So do you think this could be a tipping point, Craig? I mean, could it be a catalyst for change? You know, we've had mm -hmm. some bad situations come up before in 1997 when Lake Oroville risked flooding and there were some levees that um, 
basically failed and there's several deaths occurred. Everybody was saying then that, oh, something will be done. Nothing was done. Nothing really changed. Well, as legislators and people in funding circles always say, never waste a good crisis. Um, and this, this, this is clearly a wake up call um, that we need to look at the whole system. Um, but again, you know, I think that process has already started because of the, the five plus year drought that we just weathered here. I think the state is already in the midst of making a major transition uh, toward improving its water security in, in years to come. Now, flood security, of course, is a slightly different issue. In what way? Well, I mean, if you take, for example, you know, this dam and many of the dams in California, Oroville Dam and, and others were built primarily for flood control. They're seen as big reservoirs of water supply, but they were primarily built for flood control, which means they have to leave a certain amount. They can't fill them during the winter. They have to leave a certain amount of space in case that next big storm comes. So one of the things we have to do is actually revisit the math on that. Technology is improving. Forecasting techniques are improving. The hope is that we're going to be able to manage the levels in those reservoirs. We're going to be able to fine tune that a little bit so that we don't have to guess how much water should be in there. Another piece of this puzzle is the downstream question. We have to manage the dams differently, but we've also built levees downstream of these big dams, and we've built homes right behind those levees right. and businesses and industry. We've learned that if you can move those levees back a little bit, fewer people at risk, the rivers are able to flow, we can dump more water out of those reservoirs when we need to. Flood control is managing these dams differently, but it's also managing the floodplains differently. And I think, again, the state's moving slowly in that direction, but, but maybe mm. this is a wake-up call to move faster. And in a way, it's a, it's a race against time because the, the more development occurs right behind the level, levees that we have in the floodplain, the more it narrows down your options about how, how to push that out. But at least the conversation is now going on. Oh, I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I want to thank you both. Craig Miller with KQED and also Peter Click with the Pacific Institute. Thank you. You're welcome. For decades, Tom Amiano has been a colorful presence in local and state politics. He was the president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, as well as a state assembly member for six years. He's now drawing on that experience in his solo show, Mincing Words, where he takes on Sacramento politics and Trump's presidency. Sometimes it's a bummer. Sometimes it gets really dark, and sometimes it's going to be hard to deal with. So I have a little personal mantra. Uh, that I do to help me out. Maybe it'll help you out. Every morning I get up and I say, when they go low, I get high. <laughs> <laughs> and KQD political reporter Marisa Lagos talked earlier with Tom Amiano. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, Tom. yeah, my pleasure. Listen. Well, I had a chance to see your show in the fall, and congratulations on the extension. Thank um, you. You know, I know you had a long career in local politics um, before you arrived in the State House, and I was interested when I watched your show. It seemed like there were some things that surprised you in Sacramento. Was it the lobbyists? Was well, it the other members? Was it I, Republicans? Well, I was, I, frankly, I was hoping, I had higher hopes for the uh, Democrats <laughs> uh, when I went there. And then I realized that, you know, there are these people called dinos, uh, and uh, they were not uh, killed in the uh, asteroid uh, catastrophe. <laughs> there's, there's alive and well in Sacramento, you know, Democrats in name only. Uh, and then real Republicans. Uh, you know, we have people in San Francisco who are labeled Republican, right. and uh, I think they're a little more moderate than they would like to hear, but uh, they were quite dyed in the wool. And then there were some Tea Party people, too. A woman I call Tammy Faye Bakersfield, because she's from Bakersfield. She's the one that kept using the term sexual preference, and I finally had to tell her, look, my sexual orientation is gay, my sexual preference is Justin Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Trudeau, I like that. So. I, you know, you talk about the Republicans up there, and I had a seat right behind you on the floor when I was at the Chronicle, and so Not I heard you, you bantering with uh, your your colleagues, and I'm curious. I mean, I know that you did have a pretty good relationship with some of those guys. I mean, do you see comedy as an important way to deal with? the current political situation and to build bridges with people? Yeah, or? absolutely. And as long as it's not forced or, you know, demeaning in any way. But uh, I think that relaxes people a bit. And uh, uh, even if there's some extreme uh, and disparate political viewpoints, uh, it establishes a little bit of common ground. I mean, you know, really, when you looked, you talked about, I mean, 80 members, mm -hmm. you're going to walk around with a chip on your shoulder and a scowl on your face. You'd be exhausted. 
you know? yeah. So actually the social interaction, and that plays into the fabric of the, the policies that finally get adopted, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Yeah. Well, I'm curious what you think of our current president. I mean, is he just like a gift to comics? Uh, he is, but I'm getting tired of having a red, a red. Christmas is over, pal. Yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's, it's frustrating. Um, uh, you, you gotta find some humor in it, absolutely. And I think people want that right now, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's a, it's, it's a dark time. Um, you know, we're all hoping for some divine intervention where he's gone in one way or another. But in the meantime, um, talking of differences, it uh, really is t gonna be time to put aside some differences with people that can um, we can unite with. You know, I mean, if there's issues between this community and that community, let's take a break from that. Otherwise, if we're not unified, yeah. we're not gonna unplug this hairball. Of I the mean, president. is that what you're hearing from audiences when they, after the show at the Marsh? Because I know, well, when I was there, for instance, there was a bunch of other uh, lawmakers who came to see it. Um, but there's also a lot of people who have no connection to politics, I assume. Yeah, but I think that they're curious. And then, uh, you know, one benefit of uh, being around for a long time is, you know, the uh, uh, people do know you. Uh, and uh, this way you get to kind of uh, reaffirm your relationship with them, but also start new, uh, new relationships with people who are, who are younger. And that, uh, to me, that's fun. That's a lot of fun to be able to do that. Anybody angry at what they heard in your show? Uh, you know, I haven't uh, heard that, you know, maybe, uh, uh, maybe my accountant, I don't have an accountant, but. <laughs> Tammy Faye Baker. Tammy Faye Baker, yeah, because <laughs> nobody makes any, and, and, any money, you know. Now, there's been some people who come and, um, uh, not been up, not been upset, but uh, they see the world differently, and uh, I think they surprise themselves because they start to titter a little bit. So, Tom, you have a long history of political activism as well as being in office, and I just want to know if this is sort of you see this as an opportunity to energize young people to enter the political sphere. Yeah, I think you know humor obviously is a good tool, and uh, you know in San Francisco we're very very lucky. Um, um, we have quite a few comics who have a. Political focus: Nato Green, Will Durst, Margaret Gomez, and we have a lot of Bernieites, and they like to come to the shows. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know that the show runs through March 9th. It got extended. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, I got extensions too. You know, <laughs> the Marsh <laughs> Theater. I really appreciate you coming in to join Thanks us. Thanks so much. It's my pleasure. Well, somebody please get Amiano an accountant. Uh, that does it for us. For more of our coverage online, go to kqed.org/newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thanks for watching.